But they are going to look at a more specific theory of teleoperation, and um, specifically for surgery and see the, the, uh, the basics and uh, some more details of teleoperation. So that's the objective of lecture 12, then just to go over the theory behind teleoperation and how can that can be implemented in the lab, the different ways a teleoperation system could be implemented. So the objective is to study bilateral and unilateral teleoperation, teleoperated surgical robots, and then uh, devise some stability for a uh, teleoperation system. So in teleoperated surgery, we know that there are two main elements. We have the robot that operates on the patient, and then we have the surgical console from which the surgeon controls that. So here we have the view, a view of the surgical console. It's basically passive joysticks that you manipulate. You look at um, the surgical site from uh, using goggles. So there's a camera over there that captures the images. And this is basically the view we have of the surgical environment. So how, the big question that we want to answer today is how can we map motion from the joysticks to the robot? And uh, if the robot encounters an obstacle, for example, could we make it such that the surgeon would feel that obstacle happen? Or if the surgeon manipulates a soft object, could you re recreate that sensation when you manipulate the joysticks on the console side? Same, uh, here you have a, um, a setup of a surgery going on. You see the surgeon sitting over there manipulating the robot arm with the console and the camera, and then the robot arm is operating on the patients right there. So there is no physical link between these, the patient and the surgeon anymore. But what if we want to restore that link virtually? That is, we measure what is happening on the patient side, somehow forces, position, and so on, and we somehow display that information in the form of haptic feedback that we, so we looked at in lecture 10, to the consoles that the surgeon use. How could we implement that? What are the ways to implement that? So as you can imagine, this is not going to be a very trivial task because we have several uh, tools operating on the patient here. And to visualize the tissue, we need to also introduce cameras in the environment. So our view of the surgical site is real physics. Started, we are looking at a three-dimensional environment with a two-dimensional image. So the inherent way that uh, these robots are uh, working in the operator will make the, 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 the surgery less intuitive than it is um, when done manually because we are now passing through a teleoperation network and the physical contact with the tissue is gone. We are operating remotely and we can only see a small uh, a small view of where what we are operating. Okay, so here is uh, would be, uh, 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 one way to do that is to bring make somehow the surgeon operate the robots directly. So the, the surgeon would touch the robot and the robots would then amplify the surgeon's motion. Uh, in, some, in some way. This is one example here, but this works at a limited extent. You see here, this is for microsurgery. The robot, the surgeon holds joysticks that are attached directly to to the op the, the robot. The idea is to make the the, uh, the the operation a bit more intuitive compared to when we have the uh, surgical console and the robot completely separate. So here's another view of that. The surgical console, the Da Vinci surgical system there, the vision we get from the operating site, and this is the camera vision. So what are the advantages of this teleoperation network? It's now the biggest one, and something that some of you could uh, uh, probably realize yesterday, is the scaling factor of motion from one end to another. I can make this teleoperation network respond to my motion in the way I want. I could amplify my motion. That is, I move one millimeter, I make the robot move by five. Or, of course, more and more um, advantages would be advantages. 
would be the other way around. I move this by five millimeters, the robot only moves by a few micrometers on the other side, which increases precision of motion. So that can only be done if there is no link between the two sites. If this is done through a virtual um, link, through a teleoperation network. So that's one of the advantages. Another one is filtering out motion. We could put between these two a low-pass filter, so if tremors occur here, they are not transmitted to the robot site. Okay. What's the main limitation? The main limitation is, again, that the physical connection is lost, so you have no feedback on what the robot is doing. You are controlling passive tools, and you have no way to tell, for example, how much force a robot arm is exerting on the tissue, which could potentially damage the tissue if you exceed a certain threshold. When you do the operation by hand, well, we can feel that, but when you do that through the teleoperation network, that sense of touch is lost. So none of the surgical consoles today on the market have haptic feedback. They're all passive. But if you remember from lecture 10, we studied the use of haptic, kinesthetic haptic feedback devices as a way to restore some, uh, some of that lost sense of touch. We mainly focus on a virtual environment. That was the first element we see there. We have a haptic device that interacts with a virtual environment. The haptic device moves. The virtual environment collects its position. It has a simulation model, outputs force. The force are, forces are applied to the user using the motors. We saw how to do that with a simple simulation scenario. So that works well for a virtual environment, but now what you want to do is to replace the virtual environment with a calibrated environment. So now we have the robot there instead, and you, instead of controlling a virtual avatar, for example, we are controlling a remote, uh, a remote robot that operates on a physical environment. Now the big question is, that's the case, how do we actually restore, calculate these forces to restore to the page, to the, the operator, and make sure that these forces are an accurate representation of what the robot is actually doing. Here is a closer view of the joysticks. This one is a seven degree of freedom uh, system that allows you to do three rotations, three translations, and also grasp an object. And that's the seventh degree of freedom to or control forceps or something like that in a um, simulated uh, in a remote environment. So we have two types of this uh, of joysticks. The first ones are passive, the second one are active. And by that uh, I mean uh, that, that corresponds to their ability or not to restore or produce some force. In a passive uh, joystick, it, all we can do is to measure the user's motion. And that's it. There is no way to apply a force back to the user. Right? So it's basically a position sensor, a fancy position sensor that will measure your posi position and orientation of your hand and grip. On the other hand, we have the active Devices, those now have, in addition to sensors to measure displacement, they also have motors, and these motors could be used to actuate the device and make the device apply force back to the user. That is the case of the Happily Inverse 3 device that you have in the lab. We are, for now, using it as a passive device when it comes to teleoperation, but in lab 6, when you try some demos, right? And those demos, so as you interact with a virtual environment, you can feel some forces. And the only way you can feel those forces is through uh, proper actuation of each of the degrees of freedom in the uh, device. So that's the, the case of the active haptic device. It cannot display forces. And this is another one. This is the one used in the International Space Station to control the, uh, and the arm. I don't know if it has haptic feedback implemented, but it is definitely capable of generating haptic feedback. We should have two of these coming in the lab sometime this year. Uh, 
It's been a year and a half now, so in counting, but it will, it will, it will, it will arrive. All right, so let's then uh, now uh, turn our focus to how exactly these haptic feedback can be implemented. So it can be implemented in two ways, from the master to the slave, and to the slave to, to back to the master, or only one way. All right, so here is the simplest control architecture. We went through this one before, but let's just take a quick look at how this would work. So this is exactly what we did in the lab, lab, or will do in lab seven. We have a robot that operates on a remote environment with the intake, and we have the um, haptic device that now takes, sends the commands to the, the robot. So when you move the, the haptic device, you basically move each joint through the, the kinematics of the system itself, and then through the forward kinematics, we, uh, we get, so the measure the joints, it has that through the forward kinematics, and you get the position of the end effector, the Cartesian position of the end effector. That becomes the desired position of the robot. So the robot is simply supposed to mimic your motion. But you have now the freedom to scale that motion up and down through again here, being K. So if K is greater than 1, the robot will scale your motion up. If K is, greater, is smaller than 1, the motion will now be reduced. And it's up to you to choose that. So not only that, but we can also have a low-pass filter, meaning that if there is any tremors here, any, any high-frequency um, oscillations happening on this side for whatever reason, those can be filtered out. So the result here is a scale motion filtered that now becomes the desired position of the robot. Yeah? Um, we might have touched on it before. How can we not include the interval term? We can certainly reduce the PD. Yeah, over that. Um, that. So we have desired position now that is the position of your hand, and the current position is the position of the robot. You calculate an error, the error goes through a PD controller, and you get now a torque that is applied to individual joints of the robot. We'll make the robot move, the robot responds, we measure torque, the position. Forward kinematics, you get the current position, and that's how we calculate that. So we typically use an ED controller, but there are other control architectures we could use. We could use a PID controller. The, and then the purpose of the integral controller is to reduce the steady state error. But in a dynamic environment like this, we are mostly concerned with reducing overshoots, making sure that the system never overshoots. Right? You can imagine the, the, the problem that it could come from overshooting and oscillating with an underdamped response. It would, it would make the robot go beyond the position you want before it comes back. With surgery, we don't want overshoots to, to, to happen. The PD controller is a safer bet and is uh, typically enough. Okay, so this is a one-way teleoperation. We get position measured from the haptic device. We make that desired position of the robot, and the robot follows its position. So information goes one way, and there is nothing coming back to the operator. And we don't know exactly what the robot is going through, and you call that type of control unilateral teleoperation. It only goes from the master to the slave device. So you can see a representation of it here. We have position coming from the master and it goes to the controller. We have the position coming from the robot to calculate the error, put them to the controller, create a force and make the robot uh, move accordingly. Right, so information only flows one way. There is no feedback implemented and this is uh, what we call then the unilateral teleoperation. The simplest way to do it. That's what you're gonna, we're going to be doing in lab 7. If we if you were to, uh, well of course it's not exactly this because that controller and force calculation that's already implemented for you. So you just tell the robot I want you to go, you to go here and there. Excuse me, how it goes there, it is already implemented in the controller, so we don't see that part. 
but it is there somewhere. If you were to represent this with a block diagram, this is what it would look like. We have on one end XD, which is the desired position of the robot, which basically corresponds to the position of the haptic joystick. I touch it, I move it. That's the desired position of the robot. We will consider the master device or the haptic device as a mass spring damper system. That is, so your position goes through a mass spring damper system and then make the master device move. Once it moves, we get a desired, a desired uh, position that is now sent to a PD controller. This is here represented by a mass spring system. So imagine, for example, that you have a position on one side, you get a position on the other side. Position on the other side depends on a scaling factor of the position and a scaling factor of the speed. Right, so you're basically creating a, take an error multiplying by itself by its derivative. So you could model the PD controller as a mass damper system, excuse me, a spring damper system like that. The position comes from this, the master, goes through the PD controller, and the PD controller now creates a torque that goes through the slave robots, uh, slave robots motors. The output here is a torque applied to each of the joints. The torque goes through the kinematics of the robot, and then you have now the tip of the robot. Uh, um, moving accordingly, and you can also move, uh, excuse me, uh, model the remote environment here or the robot using a, uh, an impedance model that's simply the impedance of the virtual environment. Right? It's interacting here with a mass spring damper system. Very generic formulation, it could represent literally anything depending on the values you choose for this mass spring damper. So this is basically just representing the environment where the robot is and uh, the impedance. It, the mechanical impedance it, it encounters on its end. All right, so we have here the desired position going through the master, through the AD controller, through this late robots to make the tip move and respond with the position XT. So you see once again here information flowing only one way. We have the desired position from the master going all the way through and the robot responds accordingly. But there is no way to tell what the robot is actually doing on that side. So what are the implications of this? Well, the implications, is, uh, implications are that you are now controlling an environment without any sense of touch, without any feedback. That's how uh, all commercial commercial, haptic, uh, com commercial surgical consoles work today. We'll see why later. The, if you're interested in this topic, one of the research areas in my lab is to find ways to restore this haptic feedback through controls, sim simply do, do, redesigning this control scheme, or by adding uh, new actuators and sensors at the slave environment to measure the interaction, measure what is happening between the robot and the tissue and then somehow restore that to the user. Okay, so if we, um, if we were to model this, we can simply use a PID controller. Uh, excuse me, a PD controller. So the PD controller takes in the error in position, so the desired position of the haptic, the haptic device minus the current position of the slave robot. So this is the position error. And you do the same for speed. Right? Desired speed minus current speed, which is simply the derivative of this, isn't it? So if this is the error, this is the derivative of the error. So that's a PD control. And then you multiply each of them by proportional with the derivative gain, add them up, and the result of that is a force. So based on the error in position and speed, we calculate the force. And where is that force applied? Well, that's the desired force that it will be applied to the slave robot so that it moves in the direction we want. 
Uh, so that's at FS is the slave force, is the desired force that we have to apply to the robot so that it moves towards XD, the speed moves towards XD. Does that make sense? Is that clear that equation one is a PD controller? Right? Error in position plus error in speed each multiplied by a constant that we can choose. Okay? So once again, forces are only applied to the slave robot, nothing on the master robot. So what happens to the master if the slave encounters an obstacle? What happens, for example, if you are teleoperating the robot and it touches a bone? Nothing, right? Nothing. You won't feel that at all. The only visual, the only feedback we have is the visual feedback. So uh, until you see blood flowing all over the place, like in that uh, operation simulation, right? You won't know that something is is wrong. So how do we fix it? Well, we need to somehow find a way to understand what is going on on the slave side, and then. Uh, restore that force feedback. So one way that we can tell that there's something in the way is that we give a command to these, these late robots to go to this position XD or uh, XD and it doesn't go there. So why wouldn't, in which condition wouldn't the slave robot go to the desired position? It's already there. Hmm? It's already there. It is already there, but what, what else? So assuming that uh, it can't reach that position. What is preventing it from reaching that position? Singularity. A, sing a singularity, yeah, yeah. Constraints. Constraints or simply obstacles or something in the environment. So if so let's assume we want the robot to go to position X and it cannot go to position X. It can only go to position uh, X plus two. Two millimeters, two millimeters from it. So if it can never, reach that point, there's clearly something impeding motion. And that something impeding motion is something that you should feel on this side. Right? So there is no need to keep increasing the desired position to make it move more if it doesn't go to the desired position. So we would, the, simplest, the simplest way to then implement some sort of feedback is to look at this error. So long as this error exists, there is something preventing the robot from reaching the position. So we could make uh, now a force applied to the master robot that is proportional to the error. Because that error, what is inducing that error is the environment. So let's say the robot is two millimeters from its target. As soon as uh, I, and this is stuck there, if I keep increasing the desired position but the robot doesn't move, I should now feel a force that is increase, it increases with my motion because the robot is not responding to it. So this is clearly something in the way. Does that make sense? That a concept makes sense? Yeah. So that's the concept of a bilateral teleoperation position based. So now we'll do the, the same sort of control but on the master side as well. So before we only had uh, forces going one way. Position measured here, calculate the error, apply forces to the robot such that it moves accordingly. But we could also do that to the master device. We measure the error in position between the robot and the master device, put that through another controller, and now apply a force to the, the master robot as well. What are the implications of this? Let's assume that instead of a robot there, we had another haptic device, which we could very well do. They are actuated. Right? We could have another haptic device there. If I move the master robot, what should happen to the slave robot? It will fall exactly by motion. What happens if now I leave the master alone and I move the slave robot? Master should control the slaves. So which one is the master? Which one is the slave? It's ambiguous now because they are controlled exactly in the same way. So long as there is a position error, forces will be applied to both of them. So with this in mind, let's assume that I'm holding the master robot 
the slave robot is exactly where I want, but it's stuck there. It cannot move. As it's stuck at that position. What happens if I move the joystick away from that position? You shouldn't be able to move it, right? Because there should be now an error being created so long as you get out of that position that it um, will prevent you from moving. Of course, that will only work, will only prevent you prevent complete motion if the PD controllers have infinite gains. But assuming that the PD controllers don't have infinite gains, we could think about this as the master being at a given position here. It is connected through a spring and through a damper to that specific position, K and B. All right, so the, the slave doesn't move, and this is why we should feel that. We should feel some sort of a virtual impedance connecting us to that exact position. And the amount of force we feel then depend on, depends on K and B that we can, we can choose. Yeah. As it is implemented now, no. But we could implement it. The, uh, this blue part is missing. It's not implemented yet. Yeah. So if you mean that, you cannot move it, that means you cannot only move like the forward to the obstacle, or you, you can In any way, back. in any direction. You could not deviate from where the robot tip is if that is, is fixed. Well, you, you will be able to move. Right, there is some elasticity here. It's, uh, it's, it is exactly like having a spring connected to your hand and to the target. Right, the farther you get from it, the harder the force moving you back. So the structure of the uh, control system that we have now is exactly the same as before, but you notice here the addition of a new PD controller. So now information goes both ways. We are measuring the position of the master, applying forces to the master. We're measuring the position of the slave and applying forces to the slave. So now it goes both ways, right? With the only difference being that now there is a new PD controller that applies the forces back to the slave robot. Does that make sense? So now let's think about it. So if this is the force in the unilateral teleoperation, if this is the force that goes to the slave robot, what is the force that should go to the master in a bilateral teleoperation? The same way switch XC and XC. Aha, exactly. This is exactly the same force, but we switch these two because now from the this lady's perspective, the desired position of the master is XT. Does that make sense? From the master, what you're controlling is XT. So we want XT to go to XD. From the slave perspective, we want this to go to XT. So the equation is exactly the same. But we now flip that. And we also have a uh, uh, different gains here. So we just gave this an, in, an index one. This is so we have forces. So there's master force on the excuse me, on the slave that will make the slave move. Force on the master that will make the master move. So now the same question: What happens to the master if the slave encounters an obstacle? Or if the slave encounters an obstacle, it will likely not go to X D, creating an error, hence creating a force on the master side as well. What are the implications of this architecture in surgical robotics? Is this the best architecture for force feedback in surgery? From the point where the environment applies a force that is sufficiently large to prevent motion of the robot, we probably, uh, probably have a, a, a big issue. That means you're pushing against something really hard. The robot doesn't move anymore, and that's when you start to feel the forces. So this would work well in certain scenarios. If you want to do um, 
a teleoperation with two haptic devices, for example, but having a robot operating on a patient. You have to generate um, sufficient resistance against motion before you can actually feel something. Right, so this is not the probably not the best architecture. Can you think about a third way to do it then? So this is position based. We wait until the environment applies sufficient constraints to the robot to create a an error that is large enough that can be captured and then converted into a force. Clearly not the best way to do that in surgery. But can you think a, a, about an alternative way to restore force on the master side that represents what that, that mimics what is happening in the remote environment? You can measure the forces. Uh -huh. Exactly. We can measure the forces directly instead of estimating them. Because this is what we are we are actually doing here. We are estimating the interaction forces based on a impedance model that is completely random because we are to, we have to select this K and B here. They are not motivated by any physical uh, uh, property of the system. But instead of doing that, why not measuring the forces? So we could go back to our unilateral teleoperation system. Now the haptic device controls the robot. And you put a, a force sensor somewhere in the robot, let's say at the tool tip. And that force sensor now measures a force. And that force has uh, is sent to the controller of the slave, the master robot. And now we feel exactly those forces acting on the, um, the master robot. So that controller is up to us to define. So we could, again, we, see, uh, we can have the freedom here to scale these forces up or down. And this can go as far as allowing you to manipulate these individual cells in a teleoperation system. We could put a very sensitive force sensor in the tip of a robot, make that controller with a very high gain, so we can convert nanonewtons, micronewtons, into newtons by simply multiplying that in the controller and allowing you on this side here to, to um, move around cells and uh, feel the forces uh, as you, for example, make two cells merge or touch. This is called micromanipulation. Uh, haptics for micromanipulation is an entire area of research for, for, for that. But for our purposes, we don't need to go to that level. Right? We, we can um, simply have uh, a force sensor scale that a little bit up and down and have those forces applied at the master side. So we'll go, we're going back here to our control scheme. It's the same as the unilateral calibration as you could recognize here for the absence of the second controller. We now have this error. We have the force being measured between the slave robot and its, its environment. That force sensor is, a, is now, be, now becomes the desired force that the slave should apply to the user. And we call that F, that force Fe. So Fe is the force measured between the slave and the environment. The measured force is then applied to the user on the masters. The, the master side. So it looks like we fixed everything here. Right, what's the problem with it? Can you see any potential problem? Because haptic devices today are surgical consoles, so they don't have haptic feedback. So what's preventing from happening? But well, where do we put these four sensors? What forces do we actually measure? We want to measure the force between the tool tip and the robot uh, and the tissue. We want to measure the grasping force. We can certainly put a force sensor there, and then they'll give you an idea of how, far, how, how much you are pressing on the tissue. But there is more to it. If the, the, the tool is going through an incision, there is friction between the incision and the robot. Do you want that to be felt by the surgeon, or do you want to remove that and focus on what is happening at the tip? How do we make a force sensor um, 
we have to implement a force sensor in the tip. It has to be sterilized, potentially even disposable. If you go with a one dot force sensor that we have for the labs, it's around two, three thousand dollars. You put a medical tag on it, price jumps by a factor of fivefold. If you get a six dot force sensor, minimum ten thousand dollars. That's for lab use. If you put a, that a, a medical tag on it, the price explodes. Okay. So it's not a, a, a very trivial, trivial problem because putting all the force sensors at the tip probably makes more sense because then we only feel the forces that are between the tissue and the tool tip. But then we have the issue of sterilization, cost, size as well, and so on. How many degrees of freedom can we can we uh, measure, and etc. If you put the force sensor now at the base of the robot where the tool is attached, then you are now measuring everything that happens along the tool shaft, not only what is happening on the tip, right? Friction, um, uh, forces, lateral forces, and, and so on, as the, the robot goes in. So another interesting research area, there's a lot of people working on it. How, where do we place these force sensors? Can we develop force sensors that are specific designed for surgery? And, uh, and, and, and so on, right? So you have some research uh, in that area in the lab as well. Okay, so back to our equations here. So this is the force applied to the slave robot, to the in virtual environment, and the same PD controller that we had before. Now for the master robot controller, what is the force? Force is simply the FET. All right, it's simply the measured Force. Right, but the biggest issue again is how do we install the force sensor in this lathe robot? Okay, so let's summarize our discussion here. So, three types of teleoperation. The first one is unilateral. Unilateral forces are only applied to the slave robot to make it move. In all cases here, we have the same equation. Equation 6 holds for all of them. That's how we make these slave robots move. If you're dealing with unilateral teleoperation, what's the force applied to the master? Zero. If you're dealing with the bilateral teleoperation, position-based, then the force applied to the master is the same one applied to the slave, but now we flip the positions and speeds here. And if, the and if you're doing bilateral tile operation force based, then the force applied to the master is simply the measured force. This would be an interesting group project to implement some sort of uh, design project to implement some sort of feedback. Right? Either unit bilateral using position or using uh, force based. For force based, we can. Uh, can give you a one dot force sensor. You could try to do some interesting um, operations there with it. And we have uh, eight of them. And if you need one, just let us know. Okay. All right, so now we need to consider some uh, stability issues. As we, we we discussed this in the last lecture, if you want to simulate to create a force and give the sense of interacting with a material, for example, we are basically simulating a virtual wall that is a basically a spring with some level of energy dissipation. So back to the virtual environment, if we have an avatar here going into a virtual wall, as soon as we touch the surface of this wall, a force will be applied to, to take you out of it. Right? And this force it has to be made proportional to the displacement. So that proportionality constant is basically the stiffness of this virtual wall. Uh, so on the, uh, um, what is this, right? Right side, we see different materials that are good simulated by simply changing the stiffness Constant, right? So uh, the biggest to, to have then 
two important points here. What is the minimum stiffness we can simulate? What is the maximum? So the maximum one would allow us to simulate hard things like bones, for example. And the minimum one is the one that um, represents free motion. The robot doesn't touch anything. And when the robot doesn't touch anything, we shouldn't feel any forces. Not even the dynamics of the device itself. Right? So these are the two extremes that will, uh, that, 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 that will give a good indication of how well your haptic system is. What's the maximum stiffness? What's the minimum stiffness? So back to our concept of a virtual wall, we have the robot moving in free space. We shouldn't feel, feel, feel any force. As soon as the robot touches the virtual wall, in this case here, we have a force FA applied against the user. So the user is applying F of H, and then the device applies F A. We can move, uh, we can simulate the virtual wall as a spring damper system with some mass, and we can make this force proportional to the air in position plus a constant. Um, that it multiplies the speed, so it feels like a viscoelastic material. Ideally, K is infinity, and B is zero. Right? So it would feel really a hard material that it would not be able to penetrate. So this is back a few few lectures. All right. So rendering a wall from a virtual environment is clear, but from a teleoperation teleoperated environment is pretty much the same. Same concept. We have we apply forces. One way we measure displacement to create forces. We measure displacement to create these forces back to the master environment. So assuming that it is the master that is late, if I move the master in free space, so long as the slave doesn't touch the virtual environment, I should feel no forces. Right. But as soon as it touches that, then I'll feel a force, and that force will. Uh, applied to the characteristics of the controller that I established here using a mass and spring system. So ideally, once again, these gains would tend to infinity. So as soon as uh, a small force is felt, that force is translated to the master, and there no further motion is is. Uh, it's possible. So let's uh, dig a little bit, a bit deeper, uh, deeper in the um, dynamics of the device and see what the implications of that type of simulation are. So here I'm going to simulate the haptic device as having a handle. So the handle has a mass, and that mass, uh, that a handle is connected to a fixed ground that I see, see here, and it has some friction. And so the handle moves on, uh, is attached to a ground. That a ground and that, that, that a connection has some friction. I'm adding a spring here. The spring is typically not there, but here we could assume that this spring is gravity, for example. Right, so it's a, a very rough way to measure, to implement gravity, just to make it linear. We could assume that the force coming from the spring represents gravity. Mass is m is the mass of the device, and F a is the force the user applies. So if you want to know how the haptic device responds to command, you first need the equations of motion for this. What's the equation of motion for this mass spring system? Let's call this x, the displacement of that. What's the equation of motion here? I can, I can um, co co check with the admin if I can make you take 3610, 3600 again. That's a, that's a possibility. So what's the equation of motion? Sum of all forces equals to mx double dot. All right, so mx double dot is the input force minus frictional forces minus spring force. Does that ring a bell? Yeah? Bell. Okay. So if I want to solve for the acceleration, just divide everything by m, and that's the acceleration 
the acceleration of the, uh, the haptic device given an input force from the user, friction, and the stiffness. I can create a block diagram for this. The input is f of t. If I subtract kx from it and I subtract bf x dot and divide the whole thing by 1 over m, what's the result? The result is? Is? FAT is over here. FAT. What's the result there? X double dot. Which is the acceleration. So we can integrate the acceleration once. We get speed. We integrate the speed once. We get position. And I can now close the loop. So multiply speed by BF which is the friction in the haptic device shaft. You can close it like that. And if I multiply position by K, I get the uh, force I needed there. Right? So here we have sum of all forces divided by M accelerator. So this is how the block diagram of the haptic device, a simple, simple mass spring damper system. Right? So typically in this, K is not there, it's just here again for the purpose of simulating gravity. What else acts on the device that will make it move? So the output is the user force, the input is user force, the output is the displacement. What are, are there other forces acting on it? Friction is already accounted for over here. What other forces are acting on it? Well, the forces that we are commanding, the forces that we are controlling through the teleoperation network. So this is just the haptic device. So in fact, the forces that are coming here that will make it move are all the forces acting on it. There is the user force plus the forces that we are controlling through the teleoperation network. So if we were to add everything, we get this. The haptic device is in the center right here. That's the part we just did. I just eliminated the, the stiffness part because right? it's typically not present. So we, we see three components then. We see the device itself. What we have in the device here is just the sum of all forces applied to it over here gives a uh, position. All right, same thing we did before. On top there we have the dynamics of the user. We're going to go through that. And on the bottom here, we have the virtual environment or the teleoperated environment that we are uh, controlling. So let's go over the uh, user first. So the user is interacting with the device, and the user wants to move the happy device to a given position. That position, I'm going to call that XD. That's where, as a user, I want the device to move to. So I'm looking at it, I, want to see, I see that I'm far from it, I want to move there. So I create now a position error, right? and depending on how far I am from the desired position, I'll move the, ro the, the robot more or less. Right? So this is basically a proportional control. We are kind of trying to, to model the dynamics of the user in what happens in the brain instead of in terms of motor control, of course, it's a lot more complicated than that, but that will do the job for us here. So I'm saying that the amount I move is proportional to how far I am from the goal. Right? So I look at where I want to be uh, compared to where I am, create an error, multiply that error by kh, and create one component of now the force that I'm going to deliver to the device. The second component of that force is relative proportional to the speed. Same idea. I have in my head a desired speed. If we don't think that way, but for the purpose of modeling, we're going to assume so. And we have the desired position of the haptic device. We create an error, multiply that by another constant, and the addition of these two components gives the force that the user applies to the haptic device to make it move. 
All right, so again, this is an attempt to model motor control. Of course, a very sim simple way. It's probably a lot more complicated than that, but that it will do for us. So this force here is that FA of T that we had before. The user applying a force over here. The next element is the virtual environment. The virtual environment is what we just discussed. We have a model of the virtual environment. It could be a virtual wall or whatever. We measure the position and the displacement, position and the speed of the handle. We pass that through a model, we create a desired force. The desired force goes through the transpose Jacobian. The output is what's force times transpose Jacobian? Torque. So this is the desired torque of the haptic device. The desired torque is passed through, is applied onto the motors, right, over here. So this is white block here corresponds to all that part, the gains that are uh, between uh, the controller and the, the, the motor, quantization, uh, sampling time, all that goes in that, uh, that uh, white block there. Things that we can't model, basically. I'm going to call that, just put an intro uh, question mark there. So everything we cannot model. So we apply a force, a torque, to individual joints. The torque goes through the happy, physical haptic device. You see, this is the virtual environment. This is the physical device. The result here is the force. The physical force the device uh, applies to the user. Or the motors of the device apply to the, to, to the device itself. We sum the two, and then we apply this to the haptic device. And then the haptic device response to those comments. Yeah. And then XC and XH, those would be vectors then? Or like three? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? XD and XH would be vectors then usually, for like three dimensional? For three dimensional they are all three yeah. Oh. They they are all uh, vectors. Right? We are considering a one dot device here. Right? But in um, in three D case it would follow that too. Okay, so these are the three main components. Forces coming from the user, forces coming from the dynamics of the device itself, and forces coming from the virtual or teleoperated environment. So this is a virtual environment. Is this concept clear? Yeah? So if we were now to look at a teleoperated environment, instead everything is the same, except that this block changes instead of having the uh, the, the robot, uh, excuse me, the virtual environment, we now have the remote environment. So we have the command, command, commanded position of the robot going in. The slave robot interacts with the virtual environment. The output here is a force, and that force is now the force that is that force that we apply to the haptic device through one of the methods we saw before. Right? The, uh, Force operation, for example, the robot interacts with the virtual environment, we measure the force between the robot and the environment. That now will go, uh, become the desired force, but we can control the desired force without torque. So we convert the force into torques, send torques to the robot, to the haptic device, convert it back into force, and apply it to the device. Make sense? Yeah, and then the last one is the same, but now we are using a position-based bilateral operation. So once again, the bottom here will change because now we have the desired position going into the slave. The slave interacts with the environment, and it responds with the position X S. We create now an error between X S and XH, so remember that this is the desired position over there. This is the actual position of the slave robot. We create an error. The error goes through a PD or PID controller. This creates a force, torques, and so on. Right. Go back to the same, same idea. Does that make sense? Yeah, these three different control schemes. Right. So these are uh, simplified this is a simplified version um, of control scheme that uh, just highlights how much is going on 
in a, in a haptic device. Any questions here? No? All good? No, this is, we create a force based on the error between the two positions. So the force is here, and it goes back. All right, so if there are no forces, let's move on. So let's now take a look at the stability considerations. Stability, we, we want the system to be stable at all times, but we can't simply choose the gains um, the, the magnitude of these forces randomly, we are we have to abide to certain conditions to make the system work. So back to our um, mass spring damper system that represents here the active device and the environment. So B is the VF is the friction coming from the device. B is coming from the virtual environment. So this is a haptic device interacting with a virtual environment that has a stiffness k and a damping b right? and then m is the haptic device uh, mass so if you were to find now the transfer function between the device force applied force virtual environment applied force mh and the displacement of the device what's the transfer function We'll take the Laplace transform of equation 11, which is ms squared x of s plus b plus df times s x of s plus k x of s. Factor out x, do the whole thing, and this is probably trivial, at least it should be. I'm sure it is, and then this is the transfer function. I recognize the transfer function of a mass spring damper system. Right? So K and B are in the virtual environment. BF is the physical friction that exists between the device and its ground. We can find the poles of this transfer function. And why are the poles important again? Because they determine the temporal response of the device. All right, so if the poles have positive real parts, the system is stable. If the poles have negative real parts, negative real parts is stable, positive real parts <coughs> unstable. All right, so if they're on the left side, we are, we are good. The system is stable. If the poles are purely real numbers, then the time response is overdamped. If the poles are purely imaginary numbers, the system oscillates indefinitely. Yeah? And if the poles are complex conjugate numbers, then what kind of time response are we looking at? Complex conjugates, we have exponential and sinusoidal, which characterizes a, how they call that type of systems, a under that system. Under that. Under, over, uh, critically damped, they have a default pulse. Okay. So that's the type of analysis we want to be to, to do now, because we can actually control where the poles are, because a B and K are up to us to choose. So remember that a B and K are the stiffness, the, the, the friction and the stiffness of the virtual environment, or the controller itself. It's up to us to choose them, but you can see here that by changing them, we are making these poles move around, and potentially we can make the system uh, unstable. So if those are the poles, so this is just the uh, quadratic equation of the denominator, these are the two poles we have. So we have now to consider all the cases here. So the first case is where is when the uh, whatever is in the square root is positive. So if whatever is in the square root is positive, the roots are of this equation are real numbers, right? Because that's a real number, and they have two distinct poles, two distinct roots. If you plot that on the imaginary axis, on um, this plane, they will lie on the real axis. Right? So this will characterize a 
over damp system. We give it a command, it will respond with an exponential response. Right? Is the system stable? Yes, the system is stable, the system does not oscillate so long as this condition is respected, which again is up to us to define, because what happens if we increase the value of stiffness too much here? This may potentially become negative, right? leading to a different, a different case. The second case, there is whatever is in the square root is exactly zero. If that's the case, then you have two identical poles. Because the, the, the poles are negative b plus bf divided by 2m. They are identical, and that characterizes a uh, critically damped system. Very good. So the poles are on top of each other, and the system is critically damped. So no problem. Uh, system is still, still stable. The last case is when, when whatever is in the square root is smaller than zero. Remember that again, we are, make, we are choosing k and b. So we can make that go anywhere on, on these three cases. And in the, if that is the case, now we have an imaginary number as a result of the square root. We have now a real and imaginary component in the time response. So the poles are complex conjugate. They break away from the real axis, and they are now complex conjugates. What are the implications now? on the time response. Let's say we have a virtual wall. I'm going to go to it, and then I touch it. If it is this case, it's, it's just a step response. So the force I'm going to feel is going to go up exponentially and reach a certain value. This one is the same indistinguishable for that, but the other one is not, because now it will overshoot. Right, so the force that I'm going, apply, I'm going to apply is probably going to be greater than what it should be. It will oscillate a little bit before Status. So you can already see the problem with it. If the gains are too high, especially k, we are tending to the third case when they're tending to a under damped system. And as soon as you touch the virtual wall, it will oscillate. And that's clearly not the type of response we want, because that will give us vibrations that shouldn't be there when you are interacting with a simulated environment, especially the virtual wall. We can make the problem worse. So this is still stable because the real part is, all, is still negative b plus bf divided by 2m. So so long as this b is positive, which is always the case, the real part of the pole is still negative. Right? So the system is always stable. That's fine. But what happens if we start to increase k too much? All these poles, one will travel up, one will travel down. The damping ratio of the system is decreasing, and more and more oscillations will occur. So we'll reach a point where as soon as you touch the virtual wall, if the value of k is too high, they will simply vibrate. I intend to a marginally stable system. So here is what could happen. First case here, we have reasonable values for k and b. We touch the virtual wall, that's the force we feel, it's just a force that oscillates up comes, uh, that reacts fast and sets. If we make k tend to infinity and b tend to zero, then we are more uh, looking more like uh, to a step response like that. You touch the virtual environment and vibrations occur very fast. Uh, so you, you, I don't know if you experienced this during the lab, but if you program the, the, um, the haptic device in the wrong way with the gains that are too high, that's the type of response you will get. Did, did you notice that? Yeah? Anybody else notice a behavior like this? Yeah? Yeah, so if I raise a lot, your control gains are clearly too high. All right. Okay, any questions here? No? Okay. So here's another way to look at it. I'm going to skip one slide and just go straight into this one. This is a more generic way to visualize a haptic device interacting with a virtual environment. So here you have the dynamics of the device. 
the speed of the device, the operator feeds back and forth like that. We have position on that side, position of those two of virtual environments. So these are, these two here are the virtual environment. H of S is that a function, and this is just a unilateral constraint, meaning that uh, if you are outside of the wall, your displacement is zero, so not, nothing comes out of here. If you're inside of the wall, on this side here, then position both is non-zero, goes to the virtual environment and creates a force. Right, so these two blocks, are basically representing that those conditions that we created for forces earlier. And this is a new, a new function here. So we take, so, so sorry, before I go there, I forgot to mention this. We uh, now have this sampling rate, meaning that you are measuring the force, the, the displacement, every few seconds, typically every millisecond or um, at least a millisecond. Right? So it's not a continuous signal anymore because you let the system run and you're going to look at the position at a given sampling rate. And this sampling rate is around, typically around minimum, around a kilohertz. Right? So you're going to look at the position, measure it, we'll hold that value for, let's say, one millisecond, we let the system run, and then you look at the position again, and so on. Right? So it's no longer a continuous system. That's why we have this gate here. And that's why we convert the system from S to Z. This is basically the discrete transformation. And we go from S to a discrete environment. To move this discrete sampling back to talk to frequency domain, we have this function. This function is called a zero order hold. And what it does is that it holds the value for T seconds before it updates. You can see here. Let's assume that this is the position. What well, comes out of the zero order hold function is basically this. We, we measure the position, we hold it for t seconds, and then we let it through. And then you hold it for a new, new t seconds, and then let it through. Right? So we now discretize the, uh, the, the system behavior into this incremental, the small incremental steps. So this has an implication in the instability of the system. I'm not going to go through the details. This is a very long research topic. But if the virtual environment is a spring and a damper, exactly as we saw before, but here they are represented in the Z domain, which is the discrete domain. You don't need to know this. But it's the same representation as a mass spring system, but now discretized according to that sampling rate uh, T. A necessary and sufficient condition for passivity is given by equation 15. So this is important. B is the friction that exists in the virtual in the device itself. B and K are the stiffness, the <coughs> damping and the stiffness of the virtual environment, and T is the sampling rate. So for the system to be passive, to be stable, we need to respect this condition. Yeah. B is the radius. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So B is viscous friction. So what this equation entails is that for the system to be stable, there must be some energy dissipation. And that's what it means. There must be friction in the haptic device for the system to be stable. Which is counterintuitive because, or not counterintuitive, but it's a problem. Because remember that one of our requirements is that when the robot doesn't touch anything, the robot should dis shouldn't display any forces. But now there is going to be some force because if you move, there is going to be friction, and friction must be there, otherwise this robot is unstable. Yeah. The friction must be there. Because it's not straight away from forces and friction. How come? Yeah. Okay, sorry, say, say that again. Well, the friction has to be there for it to be stable. Mm -hmm. What's the problem of measuring it then when you put the force sensor away from the tool? We, we can, you can certainly measure, but this is, this is friction that occurs between the haptic device and the, uh, at the haptic device site, even before you before apply any forces to it. Oh. Right. And then you can control the, uh, um, 
And then you see here you have limits for the stiffness and friction that we can apply. So this is the same statement as we saw before, just in a more sophisticated way. I can link the paper that derives these conditions later. But what this entails is two things. There must be friction for the system to be stable. There is an upper limit of for um, stiffness and for friction of the virtual environment before the system goes unstable. Very good conceptual question for a hypothetical final example. Yeah? Yeah? I'm sorry, here we use the capital K and V, so that allows for the discrete uh, domain. Yes, no, this is, yeah, this is for the virtual environment. And this is the physical friction in the haptic device. Okay, all right, so that's just to say that once again, we have a limit in terms of stability. Last topic here, we're gonna have an entire lecture about this. How do we create forces in the haptic device? So if you want to use the haptic devices that you have and implement forces as uh, part of your design project, you will have to design something like this. We have a desired force. Now, where this desired force comes from, it doesn't matter. It could be the virtual environment, it could be a calibrated force, whatever. I want the device to apply that force to the user. First, we need the Jacobian, we need to convert that into torques. So how do I actually apply? So this is really important. Folks, we want to implement forces, and I have to device need to know this structure. The desired force goes through the Jacobian transposed, get, we get a torque. How do we apply a torque? How do we command the robot to apply a torque? What we can't, we can't what everybody can control is the, the current, because you know that a torque and current are proportional. That proportionality constant is Ki. That is given by the specifications of the, ro the, the, the motors. So by dividing the torque by this proportionality constant, I now have a current. Uh, from the current, I have a, uh, excuse me, have a desired current. The desired current is applied to the motors. I measure, um, excuse me, I, I messed this up here. I have a current, desired current here. I compare with the actual current of the motors, create an error, and then send a current to the motor. That creates a torque. The torque is now physically applied by the motors. We go through the inverse transpose Jacobian that creates a force, and then the force goes through the same model we had before, a mass damping system here that will make the device move. And any external forces, the user force, for example, are applied 